my name is Amata and this Red Gaming Tech video I am here with the latest collection of tech news from the last 24 or so hours and as I like to do sometimes I have a little sprinkling of console news to round things out. So what do I have for you today? Well I have for you the announcement of the Xeon D2100 series processors from Intel. Assurances from Apple that the latest line of iPhones will not be experiencing the battery related performance throttling that has of course become quite infamous. We also have rumours that Google are allegedly working on a game streaming service and maybe even a console. We also have the first appearance of the first AMD Snowy Owl motherboard. And finally, we have some interesting rumours regarding Crash Bandicoot, the Insane Trilogy and the PC. So let's begin things with the Xeon D. So what I have for you today, well I have several SKUs, in fact there are a few slides from Intel which you'll be seeing on screen right about now where you can see all sorts of helpful information, but of course I'm going to give you a bit of a TLDR. I'm not going to go through all of it because I'm not some sort of madman. However, the highest end SKU, and obviously this is Xeon, so it's not exactly, you know, low end APUs, you know, powering your hamster powered laptop or anything like that. However, the highest end of the highest end, I guess you could say, is called the D2191 and has 18 cores and a insanely low TDP of 86 watts. Unsurprisingly, it's also very expensive, as it's 2,407 US dollars. So, I have a few sections that Intel have divided these into, Edge servers, Intel Quick Assist, and Network Edge. So basically, the D, uh, sorry, D2100 is obviously focused for data center processing, and is a SoC designed for lower power, high density solutions, which obviously has a bunch of stuff that are really, really good for the data center application. So we have up to 18 cores, 36 threads, up to 15 gigabytes DD4 26666 ECC, up to four channels of course, three gigahertz with single core Intel Turbo Boost, 32 PCI Express lanes, which is insanity, and up to 20 lanes of configurable flexible speed IO. And it does make use of 14 NM. So this is just some general specs, but you know what about the D2100 itself? Again, makes use of 14nm, up to 18 cores, as already said. Maximum base frequency is 2.2, maximum boost is 3.0. L2 cache is 1.375 megabytes a core, up to 24.75 megabytes, featuring the Intel cache hierarchy. We also have 6210 watts on the thermal design point range. Again, four channels of DDR4 2666, and maximum system memory supported is 512 gigabytes, which is pretty mad. But again, this is not going to be in your home PC anytime soon. This is for the data center. Still, though, it is rather interesting, as I'm sure you will agree. However, let's go back to those categories that I mentioned a second ago. You know, again, we've got the Edge, Network Edge, and of course the integrated Intel Quick Assist. So. We have a few per section, essentially. We have Intel Xeon D Skylake Edge Server, which has three processors, the D1, sorry, D2191, D161, and the D141. So there are 8-core, 12-core, and 18-core, respectively. And obviously the top one is one I already mentioned. However, the other two are $555 and $962, respectively. However, in the Network Edge and Storage SKUs, we have six processors. 2183T, 2173IT, 2163IT, and 2143IT, as well as you know, D2142IT and D2123IT. Not exactly the most you know eye-catching or memorable of names, but they are unsurprisingly, given that there's so many of them, a rather diverse range of SKUs ranging all the way from a 16-core to a 4-core, and unsurprisingly the boost and clock speeds also vary wildly as well, as does the price tag going from $1,700 to 213 for the cheapest. So for the final one, which is the Intel Quick Assist Technology SKUs, we have five processors present, but what's most interesting is the Intel Quick Assist technology itself. It supports up to 100 GBPS of throughput, and is not present in any of the others that I just mentioned. As I said, there are five. We've got the D2187 NT, 2177NT, 2166NT, 2146NT, and the 2145NT, and these are 16, 14, 12, 8 and 8 cores respectively, and the turbos do range from 2.4 to 2.5. As I said, there would have been 
the spec sheets on the screen right now, uh, or just playing, should I say, so you can actually see all of this laid out all nice from Intel. So do check that out if you missed it. You know, you know, put the video back a bit because you missed it. However, it is there for your perusal. There's going to be timestamps in the comments as I always do. So interesting stuff. Obviously not for you or me, but still doesn't make it any less interesting. However, let's move on to our next thing, shall we? Which is, of course, Apple and the latest line of iPhones. Now, obviously, I do not need to give the backstory on this because the battery throttling, the performance and all that good stuff is pretty much infamous at this point. You know, we all know about it and it was literally for the sake of better battery life, which kind of made it more insulting. It's like, oh, this was over battery. Are you joking? However, we now have an answer thanks to a question from Senator John Thune who wrote to Apple, and this letter was then made public, basically asking whether or not iPhone 8, iPhone 8 Plus, and iPhone X were going to be affected by these battery throttling issues in the years to come, because obviously some people obviously update their phone every year, every two years, but I know some people have still got their iPhone 4, so, you know, there are some people that hold on to their phone until it literally does not turn on anymore. However... I do have a bit of a statement here from Apple. Quote, iPhone 8, iPhone 8 Plus, and iPhone X models include hardware updates that allow more advanced performance management system that more precisely allows iOS to anticipate and avoid an unexpected shutdown. So, basically, the TLDR of all of that is they have fixed this in the hardware, so it should not be an issue. And in before, in five years, I'm covering a video where, like, oh, the iPhone X explodes because of the performance or whatever. Hopefully not. But that's what Apple have said at the moment. So, uh, you know, we'll see if I'm uh, going to be eating these words in five years or if Apple going to be eating them more precisely. You know, I'm, I'm the one who promised, like, yeah, I'll be fine. It's fine. Anyway, with that fairly brief segment over, let's move on to Google. Now, obviously, my little sort of introduction to the video mentioned what this is about. And it might have probably made you go, blur a little bit because, you know, game streaming service. All right, that makes sense because, you know, they're already heavily invested in the whole streaming thing with YouTube and all of that. But the word console probably got your ears pricked up a little bit. You're like, Bleh? again? However, according to a report from The Information, and of course, I will link this in the description below this video for your perusal. I would suggest you give their article a read. I'm, of course, going to be merely giving the cliff notes. Anyway, according to them, Google are working on a game streaming service that could either work on something like the Chromecast, which is pretty nifty, by the way. If you don't have a smart TV, you know, I would recommend this isn't like a placement ad or something. I'm just saying I, I personally use one and it's actually pretty decent. Anyway, or it could be on a brand new console. And here's what they actually say. Quote, Google may be about to take its most serious steps to get into the video game business. The company is developing a subscription-based game streaming service that could work, could work excuse me, either on Google's Chromecast or possibly a Google-made console still being developed, according to people with knowledge of the project. The service, codenamed Yeti, would put Google at the forefront of a nascent part of the video game business, one that lets people play games as they're being streamed rather than downloads or using discs. Now, I know you're already going, oh no, oh no, another version of OnLive, except this time it's going to be hardware-based, yay, not. And yeah, I'm not going to lie, I'm kind of having similar thoughts myself, however, technology has progressed somewhat since then, and the internet has also gotten better as well, but as of any streaming service like that, you know, be it PS Now, or be it the one that was on The Shield, or be it OnLive, or whatever... They all have the same problem, it's just varying degrees of severity in that certain games just cannot be played like this due to the input lag and then obviously like fighting games and that sort of thing, anything multiplayer based, forget it. But obviously that's not really the intended audience, but those games just can't be played like this because of the input lag. But even then it's like, okay, if you are if you have bad internet, just forget it. So those are still questions that I have, but I'm sure Google are thinking of that. You know, perhaps it's just going to be a way of like, you know, you stream it to the console once and then it kind of caches it or something. I don't know. They did say it didn't. It wasn't going to use downloads or anything like that because it wouldn't really be a streaming service if you're actually just downloading it to the system. And you're obviously going to be you know, using the quote unquote console to play the thing, but it's probably going to be streaming from Google servers themselves. They've got a pet PC somewhere playing it or something like that. But what's interesting, however, is apparently this has been in development for a while, as according to the information's report, an early version of Yeti was already working on the Chromecast, 
and they did say, quote, An early iteration of Yeti was designed to work with the Chromecast TV streaming stick, according to a person familiar with the project, another person who was briefed about it. More recently, Google has been testing a hardware gaming console for running the Yeti service, one of the people said. Yeti also includes a hardware controller that used to play the games developed by Google's hardware team. Google has discussed Yeti with top-tier game developers, but it's unclear whether they will develop a game specifically for Yeti or only make existing stream games possible. So all of this is rumor and speculation at this point. You know, go read the information article, as I said. It's all their sources, all their information. Fortunately, I can't vouch for them, obviously. But it would be interesting, and I wouldn't be surprised to see Google try this, because it's very much in their remit. This is like right in their wheelhouse of stuff that they love to do. So this would make perfect sense for them as a company, but I just don't know if we're really there yet. The issue is, like, while you, the person watching this, might have an amazing internet connection, you never have any dropped games or whatever on, on online, you never once left a game of Overwatch because your internet decided to take a nap or whatever... But there's going to be a person down the street who has bad internet because they can't afford it. Or there might be someone who has the best internet in their area, be that, you know, in the, in the US or the UK or in the middle of nowhere. But it's it's literally might as well just be like an old crippled hamster with a walking stick going, I'm trying my best to power this thing, but I just can't do it. Like, the point is, there's not really solid internet always, ever. That's kind of the point. Now, obviously, I don't think they'll be that for a long, long time. But even in America... Like some cities will have, or areas of cities will have bad internet just because like the only company that does that area is just like lol I'm sure it's fine because we've got no competition so it is an issue and I don't think Google wouldn't have thought of this I'm not coming not burst into Google's office like I've got a revolutionary point to make no that's that's clearly not a thing but it is a concern for myself and obviously a concern for the consumer as well so let's move on to our final tech segment of the day, which of course is going to be Snowy Owl. So basically what's happened here is a computer manufacturer from Taiwan by the name of iBase has listed in a rather extensive PDF, which of course I will link in the description below as well, alongside the information article what I just mentioned. However, they have listed what appears to be the very first motherboard for the AMD Snowy Owl platform. Now this is going to be powered or sorry, based upon, rather, the BGA 2028 socket, and it's going to be powered by an 8-core, 8-thread, epic, embedded 3201 SoC, and is going to have a clock speed of 2.3 gigahertz. So what else does it have to offer as well? It also has four DDR4 memory slots and supports up to 128 gigabytes of registered memory or 64 gigs of unregistered memory, which would be ECC slash non-ECC, respectively, and this is going to be a max frequency of 2667 MHz. And we also have 8 PCIe slots, which are sitting fairly near the memory slots. And we also have 2 SATA 3 ports and a PCIe x4 M2, M.2 slot that, of course, supports both SATA and PCIe. Now, there are no integrated display outputs, which is a little bit of a head-scratcher. However, you can purchase a separate model, which also adds things like hey VGA which you might kind of need to like you know see but um, those are the specs that we have listed thanks to iBase. Of course we also have the presence of a single gigabit Ethernet port as well which I did forget to mention there. However essentially what Snowy Owl, Snowy Owl? I don't know what that is, Snowy Owl is what I meant to say excuse me, has basically been peeled back enough so that it's not like hey epic i'm here and i'm here to cannibalize some of your audience with you know the the fewer io options and pci connectors and all that good stuff now there is an analysis on this by paul which i will include a link to in the description so there should be three links the ibase one paul's one and of course the information article if any of them aren't there feel free to give me a prod in the comments or on our social media, which of course is always forward slash Red Gaming Tech, so twitter.com forward slash Red Gaming Tech and facebook.com forward slash Red Gaming Tech, so yeah. So the last item on our itinerary, of course, is the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy. Of course, numerous people, including myself, were like, hey, can we please have Crash Bandicoot on the PS4? A remake would be nice, that'd be great, thanks. And obviously, we finally got it last year, and it was really, really good, so happy with that. However, 
that is not the end of Crash, unsurprisingly given that it did way better than Activision expected. Now, In the most recent issue of licensing source book Europe Trade Magazine, a merchandising company by the name of GBI basically revealed that the Insane Trilogy will apparently be seeing a release on Nintendo Switch and PC, which is pretty awesome. A Nintendo Switch version is like, hell yes, Crash Bandicoot on the go, but of course a PC version is also pretty damn awesome. However, the interesting stuff does continue there, as apparently in 2019 we're going to be seeing a new Crash game. Now, whether this means a sequel, or a remake or remaster of an older game, but to be honest, they've already released the good ones. Obviously, you know, there's Crash Team Racing and stuff, but... The ones that people loved, at least in my, in my personal opinion, the ones that kind of had the nostalgia goggles on, we look at it, oh, remember the days, is the original trilogy, which obviously we already had from PS4. So I'm going to assume they mean a new Crash game. So if this actually happens, and if it's actually done in the way that Crash should be, but perhaps with some modernizations to help improve the slightly jankier parts, great. But I don't want it to go like modern and edgy or whatever. So, you know, let's just hope that it doesn't get ruined. That's all I'm saying. But I'm pretty hyped to see what we've got cooking. But I doubt we'll even see hide or hear of it until next year, at least assuming this rumour or this statement, should I say, rather, is true. Of course, Activision not really said anything one way or the other at the moment. So we'll have to wait and see. But I'm definitely interested. Anyway, that is me done for this video. One thing I want to say, completely unrelated, but go and watch the Heavy Falcon launch. So cool. Anyway, that's me done. Bye for now.